Go ahead. My sister's uh, husband is the percussionist for Stevie Wonder. Oh, my God. So he gave us original music. In and out. Yeah, that's, that's how you get original music. Did you hook me up? That is awesome. Hey, welcome to All Over VoiceOver with Kiff VH, and uh, I'm excited to have you here. I'm excited to welcome my guest, Phil Morris, and um, and I have, I, I'm have i rattling paper because that was the most awkward intro, because I have to do another intro. <laughs> You're so great. But uh, I'm also excited to welcome and thank my first sponsor ever, mm. uh, Bookable VoiceOver Coaching and Demos. For I want to thank them for sponsoring today's episode. Now, Bookable uh, provides one-on-one coaching and group workshops and workouts, so you can Turn to them for audio demo production, and if you're looking to sharpen your skills or take yourself to the next level or build the perfect demo, give Bookable a call. You can check out their website at bookablevo.com or follow the link off of the All Over VoiceOver page under resources. And if you're listening to this right now, you, uh, you're you going to thank you to Bookable and thank you to my guest, the lovely, the talented Phil Morris. Phil, thank you so much for joining me in today's show. Thanks, Keith. I feel very pretty today, actually. The lovely and talented Phil Morris. It's the green t-shirt. It does some Something. It's, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm 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 pre- I'm precursing the Easter. Uh, ah, yeah. Vibe. You know, we got Easter coming up. I got my LeBron Easter uh, edition oh, shoes man. on. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I'm color coordinated. <laughs> Want to bring in the spring in the right way. That's right. So thank you. I appreciate it. Oh man, uh, we've known each other for a few years. A few years now, yeah. um, hanging out and, and talking in the lobby over at CESD, and and I've been familiar with your work for a very long time. From I think, in all honesty. One of the, my favorite things that you've done, as much as I appreciate so many of the things, is is your character from Black Dynamite. Oh, right. Saeed. Saeed. The irrepressible uh, militant. <laughs> well, for those of you who, have, who don't know Black Dynamite, it was a movie uh, written and uh, starring Michael Jai White, written by Michael Jai White and Byron Minns. Um, and it's a... A throwback homage to all of the black exploitation films of the late 60s and, and 70s. And we play this unlike others where you are familiar with it being a send up. We play it almost as like a film that was just discovered. Yeah. You know, so these are real actors really playing these roles as opposed to um, um, a film about something else. This yeah. is as though you had just found this in the archives and you pulled it out and here's Black Dynamite. And I thought it was – it's just genius really. It's one of the most brilliant satires uh, and parody films that I've ever seen. Right? I mean, you know, the, the jokes are great. The jokes are hit and quit. You know, like they do they do the catch the boom mic How bit. How crazy is that? Once. Oh. Once. And then, and then he and he kind of notices it, but doesn't. Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? Or when you you cut to Honey Bee and she has a tear, and you cut back, she doesn't have a tear <laughs> on her face. And my manager said, if they cut back, she's got a tear again. I'm about to lose it. I'm about to lose it. So yeah, check, do yourself a favor. Check out Black Dynamite. They've got another one coming behind it. Um, do they really soon? Yeah, and um, I can't really tell you about it, but but they're 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 bringing it hard. Oh, wonderful! Hard. That movie. Ugh, I'm so thrilled to hear that. You know, Tommy it was one of Davidson. The, Tommy, right? Tommy Davidson and, and Mike and, Starr. Yeah. Yeah, Chris Spencer. Oh, man. Some wonderful co- comic talent. You know, uh, Buddy Lewis, a really fantastic comedy talent. But we had so much fun, probably one of the most fun gigs I've ever had. That's awesome. And all we kept doing was saying, okay, let's take this and don't change a thing from the trailer to in front of the camera. Don't change a thing. Be as crazy and nutball as you were at lunch on camera. And that's what we tried to do, and I think they captured it really well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It certainly is. Well, uh, how did you – how, how did you begin your journey? I know that you do both on camera and and voiceover work. Yeah, I'm a tweener. You know, I um I started on camera and kind of backed into voiceover. Hmm. Um, my dad was Greg Morris, uh, who was in the original Mission Impossible series from 1966 to 73. Not the movie. My dad is not Ving Rhames. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and my father was one of the first African American actors to really um, legitimize his image in television. As well as Bill Cosby, who came on I Spy the year before that. Okay. Um, so I was brought up basically in this game, and yeah. I saw it from a very young age, and uh, I was enamored by it. You know, it's we grew up on the Paramount lot at the time that Star Trek was shooting, and wow. the Brady Bunch, and uh, the Odd Couple, and you know, so like we met everybody, and. Uh, my sisters and I, and I've told this story many times, we used to sneak onto the Star Trek set. There were no hot sets. There were no security guards. I mean, you could you could steal a, a golf cart way before Laverne and Shirley and, and travel <laughs> around the lot. And they'd be like, hey, Phil. Hey, hey Iona. Hey, Linda. How you doing? Wow. So that's how I grew up. And, and so it's not really um, 
a mystery why I decided yeah. to be in this business. But that's pretty much when I started. Like seven is when I started to realize maybe I could go this way. You know, I didn't really make that decision until I was a late teenager. But mm. you know, having that influence and meeting all those amazing people that came in our house mm. week in and week out, from a Sidney Poitier to a you know, I mean, you name them, you name them, they were there. Um, so that was my world, and so this is very comfortable for me. Hmm. That's fantastic. <laughs> Dude, what what's um, as you were sort of a, a, uh, you know coming up in that environment? What what things did you notice about? Uh, not necessarily cautionary things, but what what did you experience that that helped? Helped you sort of navigate the the longevity of your career in this business because you know what I mean because mm-hmm. this can be especially for people who start early or start mm-hmm. in that community you can see you don't necessarily see the bumps in the road as clearly does right. that make sense yeah absolutely and I think that um, there are a lot of cautionary tales for second generation hmm. um, uh, entertainment folk who come out and there's a lot of bad stories that happen you know one of the problems I found was that the shadow that looms over you is so large. When your 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 father, your mother are, you know, bright lights in the industry. Yeah. How do you exceed that? You know, and 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 traditionally in our society, the youth, you know, succeed the parent and, and, and the parents always want you to do better than they did. Right. Um, but in this industry, it's very difficult if your mm-hmm. your parent is a star or a celebrity to do better. It's it's difficult just to do well in mm-hmm. this industry. So your ego mind can get attacked by the lack of success, even when you're successful. Because how do you become more successful than Sammy Davis Jr.? Right. Or Elizabeth Taylor. And you're their offspring. And how can you separate their presence in the industry at that time as well with where you're at now in this industry and all that other kind of stuff too? Yeah. Well, you know, it's identifying your own personal journey. Hmm. And I think that's what I ended up doing. And, Hmm. uh, when I realized it was my own journey, not my father's journey, not my culture's journey, it was mm. my own personal journey, then I could make decisions that made sense to me personally. And as I made those decisions creatively for me, not trying to imitate or mimic, uh, but really trying to find with, you know, first page rewrite um, mm. qualities, my own level of talent, it took me into a lot of different areas that my father really never went into. Like I do a lot of comedy, you know, I'm not yeah. a comedian, I'm not a stand up, but I do, you know, a lot of comic acting. My father wasn't really known for his, his comic side, his, his, his humor. Um, I do a lot of uh, voiceover. Of course, my father was a huge voiceover actor, actually. Mm. He did a lot of Mercedes Benz, Chrysler, one of the early voices of, um, car manufacturers and, and that kind of a spokesman, uh, presence. My father and Peter Graves, of course, at the time uh-huh. were big time. So, I learned a lot from that, but he didn't do character voices. And hmm. He didn't do comedy, but he didn't do animation. My dad was very, very serious, you know, and I realized at the time he had to be hmm. because that's the way, the way that the world would take him seriously. And he wanted to be taken serious. Yeah. He would say to me all the time, don't be a singer. Don't be a comedian. We got enough singers and we got enough joke tellers. Let the world take you seriously. Hmm. So for the first part of my career, I was uber serious hmm. and I couldn't find a joke inside my soul to save my life. I was funny outside with my friends, but when it yeah. came to like reading a script and finding the funny in a script, I was so, I was so um, focused on being significant, and, hmm. and you know what I'm saying? Yes. And separating myself from the run of the mill, quote unquote, African American talent that I kind of shot myself in the foot early on, Interesting. trying to follow my father's journey. Yeah. 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 So when I was like, well, what the, ah, that ain't me, that ain't me, that ain't me, that's when I started to find the the funny in me. That's when I started to find the other areas of characterization that I had in myself. I was a big improv guy early on with, really? with Harvey Lembeck on the Paramount lot. Yeah. Great. Early on when he was doing a, a workshop. I don't know if he started it for the um, for the kind of Happy Days Gary Marshall crew, but that's who populated that that class were the Scott Bayos of the world and the Ted McGinley's of the world. Rick Dees was in there. So, And I was a teenager. And so I realized early I had to find my voice beyond my father. And that's kind of when it started. They were doing improv classes at the Paramount lot for actors on yeah. the shows and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, at the old commissary on the Paramount lot, and it was it was Bill Hudnut, it was Harvey Lembeck, Bill Hudnut, and Helene Lembeck, his daughter, 
And, of course, Michael Lembeck is a big-time television director that a lot of people probably have worked with, and I have as well. Michael wasn't a teacher with his dad at the time, but I spent some time in that class that is invaluable to me today. You know, we talked before we got on about yeah. the language that we use yes. because of the, the listeners that you have. And I really appreciated that. And one of Harvey's edicts was that if you have to go up there and be dirty, get out of my class. Right. If you can't work your brain in a clean way to find the comedy, to find the blow, to find the point of it, yep. what are you doing here? You know, go down to the comedy store. Do that. Yeah. This is for real actors. So as a real actor, you find the way around it. You don't need to go blue to be funny. Yes. And so that's the same thing here. So all of those kind of rules of thumb I've learned all along the way. And I try to implement them as an actor so it does not um, restrict me yeah. from the muse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's that's helped with my longevity, quite frankly. That's fantastic. Mm. Did you did you st- where did you go to college or school or did you study in in those institutions or did you get more training like on the job training or There's what was your experience? There's a really valuable university that I went to and it um, and I recommend it to anybody. It's called the University of Life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's uh, I, I will never graduate from that university. It will always teach me a lesson or two. Amen. But I went out of high school into the business. Hmm. Right. I tried. Art Center uh, for a while. I wanted to be an automotive designer. Hmm. That was way too math intensive for me, right? Not the kind of part, not the part of my brain that I'm really good at. I understand. So, um, so I kind of like double clutched a bit, changed changed courses. My dad was going to do a movie uh, my summer, the senior year that I graduated that summer. My dad did this movie, so I went on location with this movie. So this movie was amazing uh, mm. called Contact 303. It was never finished. I firmly mm. believe it was only there for me to start my acting career. I don't think it was there for anybody to, to have a box office anything. I think really literally is the experience for Phil Morris to start his <laughs> acting career. So thank you, Billy D. Williams, Henry Fonda, Chad Everett, Greg Morris, and all the producers <laughs> of Contact 303 that didn't make a dime. Um, you started a young actor on his career, on his road. But um, I went on location that summer. Yeah. And it was one of the most amazing. You talk about summer camp for actors. Man. G- go on a location shoot for your summer job as a PA, which is what I was, 17 years old. Henry Fonda starred in it. Billy D. Williams starred in it. Chad Everett, Greg Morris. I mean, Buck Henry was in it. Oh, my God. Um, Merle Haggard was in it. No, these were amazing personalities just to be around. Yeah. Carl Franklin, the director, was in it. Randy Brooks, so many wonderful actors. And, and honestly, I, I'm a, because of that, I'm a big believer in the experience that you have is the universe's way of saying, you win. You hmm. win. It's like we audition, right? Yeah. You do a good audition. The universe says you win. Now, you may not get the job, but you did a great audition. Yeah. You left them with a great impression. That's right. That's all you got. That's the win you need to look for. When we're looking for the win of the check or the job and we miss the moment of auditioning, we miss the moment of beauty that the universe goes, this is where you're going to win. You're not going to win here, but you're going to win here. Can you get that? That's what I look at Contact 303 like. Hmm. I won in that experience. I may be the the biggest winner of that experience because it really propelled me on a road that I've been on for now 40 years. You know, so... Uh, you know, that's that's part of it. That way of looking at that, I think, is such an important awareness and, and a redefinition of what your notion of success is. Right. right. You know, to, to really feel like – use the expression all the time. I'll come home from an audition and say to Sherry, like, Matt, I didn't leave any money on the table. Right. I felt like like I whatever I whatever happens. Yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> and I yeah. just I got it from a from a corporate gig this past <laughs> summer. I had forgotten about that <laughs> phrase and now I use it all the time. But I, I love I love assimilating things from different places. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and um I, I learn I learn more about this journey as an actor watching Ilsa's Taekwondo instructor Come on. talk to her about Either why she needs to do this particular technique on a judo sweep. One of the things that – I don't remember if I talked about this before on, on a previous episode or not. But I love this idea of – he said just recently, a, a green belt can beat a black belt. Hmm. But uh, the way a green belt will lose to a black belt is if the green belt stands there and goes, well, that guy's a black belt. I don't have a chance. Right, right. That – that, uh, it, it doesn't matter what rank you are. It's it's are you defeating yourself before you step into the ring? Right. 
that's you know I'm I, I'm a martial artist and mm. uh, so so I've heard that many times. I was teaching Sunday and uh, we were talking about uh, the guys are going to a tournament and they're going to fight. Fighting is very different than just training. Mm. You know, uh, just like performing is very different than doing rehears- rehearsing. Yes, you know, and but it's a, but I overlay a lot of these experiences as you just kind of expressed with everything in my life. And I said to them, um, I, I, I'm not a fighter, but I am a fighter. So what I mean by that is that I don't hold in my head that I'm an aggressive guy, you know, walk down the street. If this happens, I'm going to do this. I'm not that kind of person. Hmm. But if you do step to me, I am a fighter. Uh, I have been taught the martial arts since I was seven years old. So I have a lot of knowledge and I have a lot of skill. But what I was saying to them was that even if you are not a fighter, there's something that has to happen in you when you go to fight, especially in a ring, which is beyond technique. I call it the switch. Hmm. You got to flick the switch. You got to flip the switch into a place that you need to go that you can control yourself and hopefully mitigate any damage that is going to be done to you. Mm. That's fighting. Okay. Mm. It's the same thing when I go in for an audition. Mm. I had a huge audition yesterday. We talked about it before we got on air. On mm-hmm. air. I literally flipped the switch before I went into that audition to create the reality for this character. I had to. Mm-hmm. It's that important. And I do that every audition I go on. It doesn't matter how big or small it is. Yes. There's a, a switch I have to flip that's different than me rehearsing it at class, rehearsing it in my car, rehearsing it in my house, having my wife read me the lines. This is big boy time now. Yes. I got to go in there and be the professional I know that I am, that they may not know that I am. So I have to flip this switch, convince myself that I am this character, mm-hmm. and give them an undeniable performance. When my, my students go to fight, I want them to flip the switch so that they can control themselves and give this opponent an undeniable um, uh, 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 task, an unbeatable opponent to face, something they've never encountered before. Because they haven't. Because you are you and can be no one else, and no one else can be you. So if you can get that and own that power 100% or as close to 100% as you can, yes, you're going to give people an undeniable energy. And you'll walk out of that room if it's an audition. They're going to go, what the hell was that? If it's in a ring, they're going to go, uh, you're the winner, you know. And that's kind of how I live my life is trying to project that in every moment that I live this yeah. life. And that's the success that we're talking about. And that's I don't right. expect that I will, quote, unquote, win in the way that my ego mind tells me I should win. But I know that if I do that, when I do that, I'm winning every single moment along the way in the process. Yeah. Yeah. How do you... When you talk about flipping the switch, and I, I have a, I have a definite awareness and sense of what that feeling is and what that moment is. Mm-hmm. I, I had an audition uh, yesterday, actually, doing a with a very similar thing, where there was no way I could get where I needed to get within the context of my house with neighbors. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or even in the car, it was it was in that moment. That moment is. All right, whenever you're ready is that moment is right. the cue line for that moment. Right. And what what I'd like to, what I want to try to get to uh, together is to find if we can even give a slight more definition to what that moment is. What is the character of that moment? Well, you know, come on, Kiff. If we had that, we could bottle it and sell it. You know, I mean, that's what all these. I mean, <laughs> true. You're being sponsored by a, by a voiceover um, concern. That's what they're all in business to try to give you. Yes, is that it? No one can give you the it. They can just present a process by which you can find the it Uh, because we're all different. You know, I teach martial arts. Like I said, I cannot give you the same lessons that I was given and hope that you're going to get it the same way I got it. Right. That's low-level teaching. If you do get it in the same way, good for both of us. But if you don't, the skill of me as a teacher is in finding another pathway to appeal to you so that you – so that your switch is flipped on. Yeah. And we're all different. So we have to appeal to each other in a unique and diverse way. Mm. That's why there's no it that can be sold. You can only sell the process. The it dwells within and you will develop and find the it. You might find it in your car. I found this character mm. that I went in reading for yesterday in my car on the way home the day before. I'd been rehearsing <laughs> it for three days, people. Three days. I got the lines down. I'm, I'm smart. I got the lines. The lines are not the character. Right. Do you know? Behavior yeah. begets character. Spiritual placement begets character. What you know and what you need from your character is what begets your character, not what you say. 
So even though I knew the words, I kind of was still kind of dancing around it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was outside in as opposed to inside out. And as soon as I um, assimilated the character into me and into my own wants and needs, boom, he showed up. And that was in my car driving home. So, yeah, we might be able to find it in the car. It's just that the process has to take root so firmly in you that then there's a there there, Mm. you know. And my process is really strong. I've been doing this for a long time. So I have a lot of different ways to get there. So. What, what are, what are, what are, what's some of the key moments that you've experienced that help you or that helped you define that process for yourself? As you look back over the course of your life, what was a, a bend in the river in that way? Like I, I can tell you, for example, for me, like it, it was, uh, I, I had a similar experience of my first job in the industry was crewing. And that was the first time it really gave me a sense of what my purpose as an actor would be on this set. Mm-hmm. And seeing and watching those other folks work, watching Tyne Daly work, watching Tess Harper and LeVar Burton, and seeing these people with their craft and go, oh, that's – I can see the difference between how – Tyne projects because she's Broadway and how Kelly Martin projects because she's grown up on television. Right. So watching as a boom guy, figuring out how to boom Tyne versus sure, Kelly. Sure. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. like that was a key moment for me to figure out or to discover just a small thing about how to project when you're on set mm-hmm. to make things easier for other people to know that I'm part of something rather than it's all about me. Right. I'm part of this process. Right, right. Well, you know um, – it, it, to me, you're talking about uh, the difference between technique and and embodying something, hmm. right? I, I'm a very technical, uh, I'm very you know when you're when you're a smart human being, the technical part of it is probably the easiest, hmm. right? Yeah, you know where to stand, you know how to look, you know how not to block yourself, how not to upstage an actor, you know, da, da, da. you're on this theater, you have to you know, more diaphragm project than projection than th- throat, and you know, right? So you learn these technical things. For me. The difference came when I was 17 in John Lenn's acting class. John Lenn was the uh, monitor for Lee Strasberg in New York. Mm. He was Jill Clayburgh's private coach. He was the coach on the set of The Midnight Cowboy. Mm. He, he was an amazing coach. He has passed away many years now. The, the first time I went into John's class, I was a star in every other class I went to. Commercial class, film workshop. Super funny guy. I looked okay, you know. Yep. Girls like me. It was cool, you know. I was always trying to be the superstar guy. And the, oh my goodness, it was so outside in. I can't tell you. So mm. at seventeen, going to John's class where Mickey Rourke was and and uh, Dennis Hopper was. I mean, these are serious actors. Chris yeah. Allport and and um, Bob Picardo, and I mean, really mm. great actors. Um, I did a scene and they savaged me, mm. savaged me, and I. I was so destroyed. I didn't return for a year to that class. And it was exactly what I needed. I needed to be humbled. Mm -hmm. I needed to be put to task, you know? I needed to be shown where I wasn't as opposed to where I was. And I think a lot of times we go to the place that's comfortable because we like it, because it feels good to us. It's a tough business. We want to reside in the warm, cozy place. But I think for people who really need to push and, and need to find that other gear, you got to get out of the comfort zone. Mm. You got to get to people who are going to tell you what what. You have to get to the people who are going to break you down and build you up to support you as an artist, not you as an ego mind. Yeah. And so John Lynn's class was the class that did that for me. That mm. was where I spent then the next 10 years discovering – the intricacies of the craft and not the technical work that I was so um, so heavily weighing on hmm. before that. Because, you know, you get a job, right? And you're like, oh, man, I wore this suit to that audition. I'll wear the same suit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just so – it's so counterintuitive. It's yeah. not – that's not the way you get to the successful part. It's, right. it's in continuing to reinvent yourself and rediscover and buddy up against your comfort zone so that it brings something else out of you that you don't even know is there. Yeah. And that's the magic, I think, of all of this. That's such an exciting moment when you discover another avenue or a, mm. another capillary in what you're capable of doing. Yes, yes, yes. It's like when you lift weights and you you stretch and you you're sore the next day and you're like, man, I really pushed further than I thought I could go. Yeah, you know, but you're you're sore. There's a there's a consequence. Yes. Same thing on your brain and same thing in your spirit and same thing in your soul. There's a consequence to that. And if you fail, you fail beautifully. 
Mm. Uh, Teo Penglis, who is a very good friend of mine, he's now on, back on Days of Our Lives. Um, we did the new Mission Impossible together. Oh, wow. Uh, down in Australia. And we would just go crazy over how do we attach, attack this scene and what way do we go with it? And he's like, Philip, listen to me. If you try and you fail and you fall on your face, you are still moving forward. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's a bit like this, right? That's right. Right? You fall on your face, but you pick yourself up in a whole different place. Yeah. So if you're willing to learn the tough lesson, don't just absorb the good lesson that makes you feel awesome. Right. Absorb the tough lesson. Absorb the tough criticism. Um, you know, man, there, there's so many uh, stories about people that learn from their mistakes. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like Thomas Edison saying, you know, it wasn't that I, I failed 10,000 times. It's just, I just had 10,000 things that didn't work. Hmm. You know? It's it's it sounds exactly like we were talking about about this town not being a town full of rejection. About right, you and I see it like, exactly the same way. Exactly, there's no rejection. Right, they just didn't choose you. Yeah, they just chose someone else. If I were to look at this rejection all the time, the way people say it is, who would get out of bed to do what we do? I I, I would not be able to have ever gotten out of bed. <laughs> you know, there's there's enough there's enough self. There's there's enough toughness of being able to pull yourself out and look yourself in the mirror and be like, uh, what, what are you doing? Yeah. Are you out of your mind? Yeah. You're going to drag your family through this? Yeah. But, you know, but you, you have the combination of self-faith and belief in that I've prepared what I've needed to do to do it. And, uh, and I'm going to be the person to say, this is what I provide and it's good. And if you select it, great. And if not, so be it. Next thing. Next, next thing. Next. You know? And that's very hard to do. Very hard to do. That's why a lot of people get off the train, as I say. Mm. It, it, and people re rely on you to get off the train. They want you to get off the train. This is your stop. Leave. Yeah. You know, so that I have a better chance. No, 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 no. There's plenty of room on the train for everybody. There is plenty of room. You know? More room now than ever. Than ever before. This is a can-do world right now. Boy. With the YouTube mentality and the, you know, the self-starting uh, projects that you can engage in. There's really, if you have the desire to be in this game, there's no reason why you can't. If you have the intelligence and the wherewithal and the stick to yeah, that's what it takes because you're going to get hammered. I mean, there's just no way around it. Very few of us kind of come out the box and we're successful. You know, um, we get hammered, but you have to kind of stick with it in order to find the value in you. Forget it. Remember I say it? Yeah. To find the value in you, to apply to it. Hmm. And, you know, I walk in every audition thinking, I got it. I nailed it. I do. I don't know why they don't hire me every single time I walk in the booth. And if there's a if there's a point where I look at the copy and I go, I can't, I can't do that. You know, that ain't me for whatever reason. Huh. I will choose not to go. Really? Because I'd rather them not. I don't want them to hear a bad audition if I can't own it. You know, I'd yeah. rather it's that's a job for somebody else then. You know, and it's not to denigrate the copy or uh, my agents for sending me up on anything. It's just that we're not machines. We're not. And we can't allow this business to create us into mechanical, robotic talent. And when they do that to me, you will not see me there. Hmm. Or when I feel that that's what's happening. Or it's just a, you know, I'm filling another spot, man, too, man. I just, yeah. I'm, I really believe this is precious. I really believe our talent is super precious. Hmm. And I don't think it can be squandered on every bit of copy or every audition that they, quote unquote, want us to go in on. And it's up to us as the individual not to completely empty our reservoir of creativity trying to get a job. And my father said, I've never, ever, ever worked for a living, Phil. I've never mm -hmm. gone out to do a job in this business. I, I work from passion and love, and that's it. Now, we both have families. We right. both have houses. Right. We both have real-world concerns. Absolutely. Here's what I would answer to the people who go, well, yeah, but you got to get a job. That's uh -huh. right. I do. I do. But if I wanted it easy, I'd go do something else. Hmm. If I wanted it given to me, there's a lot of other things to do. This is something I want to do, yes. But my spirit needs it. Yeah. Like water. I yeah. need this. And I don't do it because I necessarily want to do it all the time. I need to. I will. And conversely, I will go on auditions. Just because I want to audition. Yes. I just want to exercise this muscle. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so then the universe goes, good for you. I'm going to give you a win. I don't know if you'll see it. 
But when you walk in this door, you're going to see somebody and they're going to recognize your work. Yeah. Or the casting director is going to say, great job. Yeah. You may not get it because they can't give it to you. But you walk in the door and honor your talent, honor your path. The universe, God, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. knows that and recognizes it. And when you don't, it knows that too. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I, I love talking hey, welcome to back you, to our show. Stump, welcome back to our show. Stump the host. Yeah, well, this it happens to me all the time. And it's fortunately for me, I'm building it to be a little bit part of my process of, of being a host on the show of like of sometimes sitting in awe of the moment that was just shared. Because it's it's it is hard to you know I feel in particular and it's happened many times in this room and and with the with the inspiring people who've come in and shared their point of view that that I could go uh that's great Phil. So let's talk. <laughs> uh what's and, your favorite color? And even though it's even though it's dead air for a moment, I'm not afraid of that cuz I I I love the I I I really truly resonate with all these things that you're saying, and and I feel that, you know, we, as as we've talked before, we we talk so much about everything outside of the process of being an actor, but how it all feeds right back into that because it's the center of who we are yeah. as creative beings. I, I've, I've stumbled upon what I believe is the meaning of life is to create, mm -hmm. and in mm -hmm. in the in. in, in not only does it tie with the theology that I was raised with, but it also feels right to me that that even in even when I've got no resources, even when I'm broke mm -hmm. or without uh, stuff, I can always grab a piece of paper. You know what I mean? I I just I feel called to make, mm. and I feel like you know it's it's one of the things that i love about this town is its vastness mm -hmm. and its openness to any kind of creation it's true and, and you know what's our highest calling is to probably create another life yeah a, to 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 you know promote the species as yeah. it were so if that's our highest calling then you're right create creation is is the essence of life right um literal life and spiritual life yeah it's how we connect with the village of humanity. Yeah. You know, it's how we interact with this village. And we are not alone. And when you separate yourself so firmly, consequences. Absolutely. Problems. You need to in ingrain yourself within the society or the village that you're a part of to understand really who you are. And when you don't do that, you only are you're informing just a part of yourself, hmm. not the totality of yourself. Yeah. Um, so division and separation really don't work for human beings, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, inclusion, support, love, and 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 a, and a group consciousness, born of the individual consciousness, mm. not the group consciousness that denigrates the individual. Right. But that realizes that each strong individual creates a stronger group consciousness. Right. And um, so I'm always kind of on about. You know, find yourself, find your authenticity, you know, be as real to yourself as you can be, yeah. even if it goes against the, the, you know, the the popular notions, you know, whether that notion is an agency notion or even mm -hmm. your wife, you know what I mean? That's, mm -hmm. They love you for you. And yeah. so you have to keep being you. You've got to be you in the context yeah. of any of all those relationships, especially the closest, most precious ones to you, because if you're not fully yourself in that context, you become something other than you know, Sherry says it to me all the time. She's like, I didn't marry you to be somebody else or to mold you into what I would think you'd be awesome if. Right, right, right. It's right. you are awesome, period. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I love you for warts and all, even if I almost ruin her spatula when I'm clean. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, I did that this morning. I was cleaning some egg out of a frying pan. And she was like, you doing that with that tool is like me propping up the Xbox to hold something up. See, and I was like, I, OK, Got I understand. I'm Walking sorry. away. Yep. <laughs> 100% like respect and understanding and all that and stuff. And you know but, who gets it firmly are your children. Yeah. If you're not authentic, authentic with your kids, they get it. Mm. And they won't trust you. Hmm. They won't trust you because you are not trustworthy. You know, my kids, I was as real with them as I could be, warts and all, as you said. Yeah. So that they understand I'm not lying to you, whether you like it or you don't. 
These are lessons that I've learned the hard way. This yeah. is how I learned it. I'm not sugarcoating it for you because when you hit the bricks and the stuff hits the fan. The bricks aren't sugarcoated and it is the stuff. Yeah. And if I've told you that's not going to happen, everything's going to be great. And then it happens. What are you going to think about my counsel? Right. You know, so I try and be as real with them as I would like them to be with me. My mm-hmm. kids are no longer kids. They're, they're real, in fact, human people. Um, uh, 31 and 27, <laughs> but, um, you know, that's how we, when we're the best of friends, we, my, my oh, wife and my kids, it's fantastic. And I don't know any other way to do that other than be authentic. So it's the same thing as you do in your work as an yeah. artist. Yeah. The closer you get to that, possibly the closer you'll get to getting the gig. Mm. You know? Yeah, that's right. That's right. What, what is your, what's your process from the moment a script shows up in your email box mm-hmm. to the point where you go through the process of saying, all right, uh, I'll be there at 10 and then uh, roll in and go into the booth. What, right. what, how do you prepare yourself to do? Uh, are, we talking, are we talking voiceover or on camera? Well, I'm curious also about the difference between the two. How do you approach those pieces differently? On camera is a little more comprehensive because mm-hmm. for me because it's my whole body. It's my, it's my, it's everything. I mean, they're, they're assessing everything. Yeah. Um, so the movement, the blocking, um, my countenance, you know, vocal placement. What I look for, uh, it all depends on how it comes to me. If mm. it's a full script, I read the full script. Don't read the sides at all. Read mm. the full script to understand the lay of the land. Okay. What is the tone of this? You know, what are the writers? You know, they, they, I didn't write it. You know, they, they've been living with this for months or years or whatever. Let me see and feel and hear their voice. What are they saying? You know, okay, and then I see, hear and feel the proceeding. Then I look at my character. What do I love about this character? Hmm. I have to fall in love with this character. I have to want to. I have to want to look and see him winning. I want him to win in whatever way that means to me. So I then look at how do how can I love this guy? Hmm. What about him makes me want to be him? And then I try and underscore those things because those are the strengths. Then I work on the weaknesses, the places that I, I'm not so clear about them. Um, and so those are the – that's the kind of three steps that I use. I use the I, the full overview of the universe. Mm-hmm. What universe is this person playing in? Who is this person and how does he affect me? Where can I want him to win, right? Uh-huh. And then what don't I know that I have to fill in? To make him a complete character. Because if I only play the parts of him that I like, that's only a part of him. Yeah. You know, So I have to fall in love with all of him. And uh, yeah. when I do that, I, I, I take away the judgment of what kind of project it is. You know? Mm. Right? It yes. doesn't matter. Because he doesn't know he, it's a Disney show or an ABC show or a, <laughs> right. a feature with J.J. Abrams. Has no idea. He's just doing his journey. 24-7. And you got to take off whether it's a multicam or a, or a – They have no idea. Right. That's technique. Hmm. Right? Right. Multicam technique. Right? Yes. Single cam technique. Character has no idea about technique. Right. Has no idea that we're having a, a – you know what I mean? They don't yeah. know. So you have to play them and honor them, not your ego mind that says, I'm in a TV show. I want to be a cop. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It's, that cop has no ideas in a TV show. Right. A cop is busy right. trying to book somebody. Just did an episode of Blackish. A couple, couple of weeks ago. If you announced like three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, what, the, the lady who plays my, my, my wife in it, Valerie Pettiford, phenomenal actress, mm-hmm. Broadway baby, Fosse girl, brilliant. Wow. Big fan of Blackish. Big fan of Blackish. I mean, she was talking to the kids. She was talking to Andy. She says, Oh my God, I'm such a big fan of the show. Such a big fan of the show. I had to pull her aside and I said, Look, you know, our characters have no idea we're in a TV show. Mm. They're not a fan of these people. We have no idea who they are. Right. She was like, Oh, Oh, that's right. Because she was coming into scenes as though she knew them. Oh, wow. You know, and and that can get in our way. Yes, it can. When we go to a show that we like or we go to a place and we admire this director, we admire that thing. This has happened to me a couple of times. And so I've changed my process even with that. I try to will away the fact that I know anything about this project because my character doesn't know it's in the this movie or the that TV show. Yeah. And so that helps me stay honest and keep him honest. His reactions are honest. The dialogue's just dialogue. I'm not trying to lead him anywhere. I'm not trying to get a job. Right. I'm just trying to get it right. And 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 I so I walk away from those auditions feeling clean. Hmm. You know. Yeah. You know. I I I like you said. I didn't leave any money on the table. I left it all out there, man. That's great. Yeah. 
How, what's your in terms of voiceover process? Do you approach that differently, or or uh, in a sim? I mean, obviously, I think with a with a commercial read, perhaps versus versus a, a video game or or a character in an animation. Uh, how where where do those where does your process intersect? Um, voiceover is a little different for me, and maybe shouldn't be, but it but it is because there are so many different techniques in there's narration, there's animation. Yeah. And it, it's all not it's not oh, all organic, you know, yeah. it's, it's not all conversational. Yeah. You try and make it that. But when you're talking about a product, um, unless you have a great connection with it and you really love it, um, it's always going to sound a little like you're selling something to me, yeah. like you're selling something. Um, so you have to really play with that. How do you make it more generic? You know, there's a very um, everyman voice in the world right now. It's not very yeah. narration oriented. Yeah. yeah, they want to. They want you to sound like their cousin, or you know, the person down right. the street. You know, they don't want you to sell it. Really. Yeah, the direction is always. So you're talking to your best friend. Yeah, just just to make a so conversation. Like, All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. I get that. But what's my point of view? Hmm. You know. So then we start to get into that stuff, and then yeah. it, and voiceover just breaks off. It just there's only so far you can go with that, unless it's a a project that that really incorporates that, like a lot of the video game stuff. That's real acting, you know. There truly is yeah. wonderful. I find Beautiful so writing. many wonderful challenges mm-hmm. in that, and mm-hmm. uh, especially when, even if and because often we don't get the full script. Right. You know, sometimes you don't get the accompanying dialogue to what you're saying. Right, because it's very secretive. You know, that stuff yeah. is very secretive. A lot of, a lot of non-disclosure, non-disclosure agreements you sign. Um, but that's no different to me. I have to fill in those blanks. The thing I went in for yesterday, a big show, big thing, um, they gave us just the dialogue. And even that dialogue they took from me at the end of the audition and shredded it. Yeah. Right? Um, so you're just given clues. Those clues, then, as the artist or the creator... You have to then fill in. Yeah. You got to fill in the ghost notes. You got to fill in the gray areas. You got to fill in that. Now, how good are you at that? That's right. that's what they're looking for. That's that's why they're either going to give you or not give you the job. And and I, I've found the thing that has helped me the most with those with the ghost notes is uh, is improv training. Mm-hmm. Is is having that improvisation background and being able to have that in that context to be able to just make choices. Yes, strong, 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 strong believe choices. In them. Yes, and then you know, like what happened with the audition yesterday. I went in and I had made strong choices and was redirected immediately. Mm. Like even before I started going, of like, okay, first of all, you're not upset. <laughs> so so, and then saying, and this was the the benefit of the improv of saying, oh. Yeah. All right. Well, forget those choices. Let's do something else. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But but having um, having that that sense in in place is I felt like is very has been very helpful. Well, yeah. But again, they they might just want to see if you can take direction. Yeah. You might have been right on the numbers, and they're just like, you know what? See if this guy can take a curveball. Yeah. And so then that that improv training really does help. You know, unless your your preparation is such that. Uh, I just don't see it another way. You know, I just, yeah. I mean, this person's obviously emotionally in this place. And so you want me to go there for what reason? And if mm-hmm. they tell me, just try it. I know they don't know what they're talking about. Hmm. If they say, look, I get that. But he has no empathy. So he doesn't have that emotion. So don't give him that emotion. I, now I know what you're talking. Great. Now we can we can deal. But when you just tell me, just try it. Just as another way to go. Now you're you're forcing me into technique land, hmm. and I'm not. I don't want to be that guy, you know. I mean, I can be that guy, but I don't really want to be that guy because it's inauthentic to me, you know. If you give me something that I can ground, now we're both better. Your character lifts itself, your writing lifts itself, and so does the reality of whatever it is you're trying to do—commercial, anime, whatever it is. Yeah. And I think there's no difference when you walk in a voiceover booth. Then when we talk about the preparation, there's no difference. Hmm. You know, a VO booth or a VO gig and, a, and a, an on-camera gig. Right. You know, it's just the nature of the technical work in terms of narration, animation, and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. But essentially, it's it's the same kind of work. Yeah. That strong foundation of understanding why the character is doing what the character is doing, even if it's a narration, Needs you can and wants still you need Trump to have everything. A, yeah, you know where they came from, where they're going, what they need, what they want trumps it all. It's all in every bit of copy we ever read. I love the way you defined uh, how you talked about how the character finding how the character is winning when mm-hmm. you were talking about that. Mm-hmm. That that helped crystallize something for me in terms of along with needs and wants of trying to align my own wants and stuff to see, oh, I want the guy to win. Like, is a really sharp 
mm-hmm. like positive action to play. I really, mm-hmm. I really like that notion. Well, you learn that when you play villains, hmm. because you can't just go, "I want," because I want to. <laughs> I want to overthrow the world because I want to. Right. There's a burning desire in a Vandal Savage, which I played a few times for Justice League. Yeah. Whether that's I'm proving to myself that I'm that I matter. That's strong. Yeah. You know, for an immortal who's been, he will never die. He will always be here. He needs to matter. So how does he matter? I control this. I control that. These people love me. I become, you know, a totalitarian figure. So I mean something. I matter. From Vandal Savage to you and me. Yeah. We want to matter in this world. We want to resonate. We wanted to make a difference that we existed and that we have what we have. And everybody wants to be heard. Yeah. You know, so you find those ways of giving your character the win, you know. And, and in that, you can play anything. You'll justify anything. Yeah. You can play the most reprehensible people on the planet because you realize that that human emotion, that human need is within each and every one of us. You just got to find what it is. Yeah. And the more universal you make that character, the more relatable and understandable and empathetic right. that, that character can be for the story and just raises the stakes for everybody. Absolutely. Oh, that's wonderful. Absolutely. Well, I've got a uh, – I'd like to share something. This is a, a cool segment that I'm doing in the show. You can mm-hmm. grab a sip of water uh, sure, if you'd yeah. like right now. But this is uh, – Like a sing or something? What am I doing? No, no, no. <laughs> this is actually uh, courtesy of Bookable. It's a – It's a. Uh, we're doing a um, – like there, it's a cool tip. It's like a pro tip. So, um, so here's Rick Wasserman with Bookable to share a, a oh, cool, cool pro I tip. I need it. I need it from uh, from uh, from Bookable. Here we go. Hiya, I'm Rick Wasserman from Bookable Voiceover Coaching and Demos. Here's a little tip. You know how people say that when you smile, we can hear it in your read. You know they say we want this to sound friendly and bright and happy. Make sure you smile in the booth while you're recording it. And lo and behold, when you get outside the booth and you listen back to it, it does sound like you're smiling. Well, here's the tip. If you frown, we can also hear you frown. And if you grit your teeth, we can also hear you grit your teeth. If you ball your fists in frustration, we can hear that too. People are able to hear your emotional gesture in the recording. All of your emotional gestures, not just smiling. Go ahead, try it. Did you hear that? I was smiling. (laughs) <laughs> and we're smiling too, right? That's right. <laughs> oh, man. That's a good tip. It is. That's a good tip. And it's, uh, I, I think uh, it's the, the whole process of this journey and how different people approach this work uh, just fascinates me. And mm-hmm. I, especially because I, I came at it from a place of having no training in voiceover whatsoever and just right. trying to figure it out as I go. And paying attention and listening to what other people's experiences were. And how, how did you find yourself in voiceover? I know you backed into it, but did yeah. you um, – uh, were you on something that yeah, brought you into yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it, it all started with um, uh, The Legend of Mulan, the Disney movie. Um, oh, wow. They had Eddie Murphy doing the character, the, the dragon, Mushu. Mushu, Mushu yeah. Mushu. So Eddie, living in Orange, New Jersey, didn't want to come out to L.A. and do what's called the scratch track for the animators, which is their preparatory work. Because the animation process is so long and intensive. Yeah. So they have an actor come in to approximate each character and so that the animators can get started with the scratch track. Interesting. So they brought me in because I had done um, the Jackie Childs character on Seinfeld. Yeah. They brought me in to do uh, Eddie. And um, I came in and kind of riffed. And they said, well, what do you think Eddie would do here? And what do you think he'd do here? And so I did kind of crazy stuff. And I did the whole movie, you know. And then Eddie came in and did the final which was wonderful. And then I um, got a call from them again, maybe a year or so later, uh, about the Atlantis. Uh, yeah. And they said, we have this character, Dr. Sweet, and we'd love you to do the scratch track. And we don't have anybody set for it. We, we love your work on Mulan, but a bit about. Okay. So I go in and I do the scratch track for Atlantis. And I say at one of the sessions, I'm like, look, if you don't find Morgan Freeman or Danny Glover <laughs> or fill in the blank, if they're not available or you can't afford them or whatever, give your brother a call. <laughs> and so like a month later, they were like, well, you got the call. You're the guy. And uh, so I went in and started doing Dr. Sweet. I had no voiceover agent. I had no, ta- I had no training. I mean, just, I'm an actor. Yeah. So I went in, did the show. Then 
I ended up getting um, the PJs, replacing Eddie on the PJs. No kidding. No kidding, at the same time. And um, so I'm recording the PJs because Eddie, again, didn't really – he wasn't sure if he wanted to keep doing it. Yeah. So they would separate me, put me in a booth, uh, and they'd – they had everybody else in the room and I was separated just in case Eddie wanted to do that episode they would lift my voice and put him in so I did many 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 episodes of the PJs and Kevin Michael Richardson oh yeah played a character on the on the show as well and he's awesome. like oh man he's, he's great great to work with you man great to work it's so great you got it who's your agent I'm like I don't have one he's like what you don't have an agent and uh, as a matter of fact people that is a perfect Kevin Michael that Richardson that is a perfect Alrighty, Kevin Michael I'm telling you no um <laughs> So he says, you know, I have this great agency, and so that's that's when I went over to CED at the time, and yeah. CESD, and Kathy Lizio was my first agent um, over there, and we've been together ever since, and I just started working, man. Yeah. And um, I don't judge. I don't judge. That's probably one of my best qualities. I don't, like, if I say yes, I'm going, we we, we in. Yep. We're a thousand percent. Yeah. So I don't know what not to be or how to be afraid of anything or yeah. – I just don't. You know, and so I think that that courage. Now, there is a tip. Hmm. Courage is huge in your art. Hmm. The willingness to do whatever and not be afraid and not think you're going to look like an idiot. And, not, you know, for years I felt bad about that. For years I was trying to be the good looking leading man, romantic lead dude. You know, I wanted to be the, you know, the head of the CSI. Well, I mean, yeah, that's cool. But it's not really for a bunch of brothers to star in their own dramatic series. I don't know if you've seen The Landscape of TV, but that's not really what's up. So I had to really figure out other <laughs> muscles to exercise. And that, and so my comedy started to come to the, to the forefront. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's when all that started to go crazy. And I started to learn. I learned a valuable lesson. Stop taking yourself so seriously. Yeah. You know, allow for the muse for the influences to tell you what you are as opposed to you going, this is what I want to be. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be this. Well, you might miss something special that's coming to you because you're trying to put forth your agenda so firmly. Hmm. You miss these other parts of yourself. And hmm. that's what was happening. I was missing it. I wasn't getting it. And so when I finally kind of got was beaten into submission, <laughs> you know, then right. this other stuff came to the came to the surface. Right. It takes tremendous courage to open yourself up to being – whether it's everything from looking foolish or putting yourself out there or just simply saying, I want this thing for myself right. and I don't know how to get it, but I'm going to take a risk to do it and see what happens. Right. And maybe my life will be better or maybe I'll just fall flat, but at least I will have moved forward. That's right. That's right. You know, if it's on me, then it will be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's how I really feel. And I think that if you're going to be in this business, you can't be a retiring flower. If you're shy, great. If, if you're not super um, uh, uh, extroverted, you can still be a great actor. Yes. But the one thing you must have is a sense of yourself that is beyond anyone else. And if you do not have that, the first little punch in the face, you're going to go back to accounting school. Yeah. You know, you're going to go back to your mom and dad or your hometown. Yeah. You're going to give up because this is not easy. It just isn't. And, and, and you know, we, if you've been in for five minutes, you know it. Yeah. It's interesting. The, the, the punch in your face is in, in this town is the equivalent of just getting walked past. <laughs> You know, exactly. like, like if, and, and I think I'm trying to, as, as we rebel against that notion of rejection, rejection, yeah. rejection is, is, it's that moment in junior high school at the roller skating party when they go, okay, and now it's time for girls choose the boys. <laughs> ha, 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 I knew this. There she comes. Here she comes and she skate right, right by, by me. you. Yeah. I Ooh. suck. Ooh. And, <sighs> and you can't make that correlation. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Just because she doesn't stop and take your hand, it doesn't mean you suck. It just means that she wanted to skate with Mike Leap and right. not with you. Right. And maybe you should just go play Donkey Kong again. Right. Yeah, again, again, you know, you're, you're a ski ball, but, but you're a like, ski ball champion. Or, or you stay out there and you wait and you don't judge the girl whose hand who's come, that comes to you. Well, it's perspective, right? Yeah. It's perspective. And it's how you look at it and understanding your journey. And that this is – like I always say this is – my life is like a novel I'm writing. And how do I want it to be written? Hmm. Do I want it to be written with bitterness and anger and, and, and avarice? Or do I want it to be written with you know 
focus and discipline and, and strength and resiliency and and that's how I want it to be. Yeah. Um, you know, I do a lot of seminars and training, and, and I was in the seminar with this guru one time, and he was like, you know, people want their lives to be easy and placid and calm, and the waters to be, you know, just just like I said, calm. But when you read a book, you want the most dramatic, the most romantic, the most huh. wonderful stories. You go to a movie, you want action adventure, you want you want huge mood swings and dramatic shifts. We want that in our entertainment. Why don't we want that in our lives? Why do we will that away in our lives, but we chase it when we go to the theater or we go to the film? No, no, no. Embrace it when it happens to you. Don't Mm. will it away. Mm. Have your life be as explosive and as manic and as crazy and beautiful and loving as you possibly can make it. Now you're alive. The other way, you're just existing. Yeah. You're just hoping nothing bad happens to you. That's not living. That's just a maintenance program that will never work. (laughs) <laughs> it will right. never work because drama and, and chaos and conflict will find you yeah. even if you live in a cave in a, on a hillside. Yeah. So so don't run away from it, man. Run towards it and, and challenge it and dare it and, and bear up through it. Yeah. And you'll find that your life is like 10 times more fun. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. It's it's. It was something that we were talking about f- beforehand, too, about, you know, the lessons you learned from from watching your father's mm. journey and how how you made choices that that embrace the variety in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you say stuck, you, you know, you start dying a little bit. Mm. You know, if you hold if you become successful and you start to hold on to that success, you know, because that's how you made it. Then you you disregard the evolution process that is ever constant. Mm. And that has to inform you more than holding on. And I think in this country, we're seeing a lot of fear of people who are trying to hold on to something that they think they have and they're afraid of losing it. Yeah. You know, in fact, that stuff that they're holding on to is not the stuff of life. You know, that's just stuff. It's just stuff. You know, and so the more we can kind of um, divorce ourselves from having to cling and chase chase that stuff, the more we'll find the there there. Because the more stuff is in the way, the less we will see the there the less we will see the essence of what we're trying to be and do because we're holding on to our, our stuff so firmly, you know. We are our houses. We are our cars. We are in L.A. It's such a car culture. Yeah. How many people do you, you see were driving their Beamers? And I drive a Beamer. I, do, you know, I have all that stuff. But it doesn't define me. Yeah. Whereas in many people, it defines them. And it isn't the it. And I hope that we can find our way past all of that to, to really connect with each other and yeah. look at each other and go, brother, we're part of the same tree. We're part of the same branch. If yeah. I hate on you, guess I'm hating on myself. That's right. It's so crazy. So that's what I'm hoping we're going, but I don't know. I, I, I feel like the more we talk about it, the more we are. You know what? You're right. You're right. The more we shed light on it and the more people who live in the light and our, 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 our understanding of the darkness, I get yeah. it. Yeah. My head is on a swivel. Like I said, I'm a martial artist. I understand that there's conflict in the world. I just don't want it to overwhelm me. Yeah. You know, and that's all I can control. Can't help it. If, it. if it overwhelms you, I hope to be there to support you so we can both get to the light together. Right. But I can only really control my light. Right. So I, I, I have this conversation with my folks a lot lately, especially given the political climate and regardless of where you fall politically, I feel like the only real difference we can make. And there's lots of places we can make difference. But if you want to make a difference, you've got to make it in your community, in your neighborhood, by how you treat the person walking down the street next to you. That's where you make the difference. It's a simple thing. It is. You know, we think we have to put our arms around the whole thing. We can't. There's no way you can. My arms, I got to, I'm, I got to, I have an impressive wingspan (laughs) without a doubt. But at the same time, it's about the size to embrace one person. And if we can make a difference there. There you go. That's where Come on, that's man. where it really matters. Come on, man. You talk about how you're going to, you know, fix our community or make America great again or any mm-hmm. of those other things. America, I, 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 you know, I've never gotten political. I don't on the show anyway. Sure, I sure. try not to. But I, I like what the president said the other day about the country is already great. <laughs> and we're the ones who are responsible for making it great by how we treat each other. Mm-hmm. How do you treat your neighbor? Mm-hmm. You want to treat it. You want to make America great. Treat a child great. Yeah. You know what I mean? Treat your grocer well. Right? Yeah. Treat your gardener well. Treat your person, you know, treat a person walking down the street like you say, well, you know, look at people with love. Don't give them the stink eye. Yeah. You know what I mean? If somebody cuts you off in traffic, that's just the way it is, people. So be it. No need to run into them. Right. No need to flip them off. You let them have the whatever they have. Let, leave it with them. Yeah. Don't, don't accept that. 
I mean, you know, man, we could talk about all this stuff for forever. As we bring it back to our, our chosen profession, that's yeah. probably why I chose to be an actor. Mm. Because I, I realized that I could maybe have an effect on people through my performances, mm. through what we say, yep. through how I comport myself in public. You know, like I said, I was brought up in a celebrity household. Yeah. My father was a celebrity when I was six years old. Uh, he was one of the stellar lights in my community ever since I can remember. It was always impressed upon us that that wasn't important. Hmm. What was important was that he was a good man. And being a good man is what was important to me. Not that I was a famous man hmm. or a rich man or, or an influential man, but that I was a good man. Hmm. And that's what my parents taught us. And that's that's the best and only lesson that I think they could give me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. They could give me a car. They could give me this. They could that, 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 that. But that's just stuff. That's the stuff we were talking about before. Right. Being the good man that I'm hoping to be in my life with my children, with my wife, with my friends, in my business, that's the legacy. Yeah. That's it. Phil, uh, it's just been such a pleasure to have you on the show, man. Thanks for having and, me. Buddy. And, uh, we've you know, talking about it for a while. We've so been man. talking about it for a while, and it's really great to be able to just sit down and talk about it. How can people, what do you have coming up, and how can people find you? Uh, like I said, I have an episode of Blackish that's going to be hitting the airwaves soon. Very, that's, very funny episode. I um, love Anthony. He's such a great guy. He's a great guy. I've known him forever. Tracy Ross, I've known her forever. Mm. Uh, I'm doing an episode of um, Baby Daddy next week. I start next week. I played, oh, great. I played Taj Maori's dad. I've done that for a while. Um, got some other things. Got this web series called Fudge Brownie coming up. It's going to be absolutely ridiculous. I think we've talked about it a little <laughs> yeah. bit. Yeah. Uh, if you have me back, if it's up, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. Great. Um, writing a bunch, trying to create this company. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. Great. Very, very happy, very active right now. You've got a podcast that people can tune into as well, right? Right, yeah. I do a podcast called Living the Dream with Phil Morris. Um, we have episodes that we've we've done last year. We're starting again this year very soon. I'm super busy, so it's very hard to get it yeah. together. Yeah. But um, check that out because we'll be back again very, very soon. And, and uh and I think you'll like the dialogue that we have, very similar to this. Excellent. Yeah. And people can find you on Twitter and stuff like that? Twitter, or? at the Phil Morris. At the um, Phil Morris, correct. And that's pretty much uh, – that's me, baby. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank and uh, I want to thank also Bookable VoiceOver Coaching and Demos. Be sure to check them out at bookablevo.com for all your coaching and demo needs. And we will be back next week with a brand-new show. And if I can get the mouse to activate – I've unplugged the mouse, Gabe. <laughs> and thank you very much for tuning in. That's all over VoiceOver. <laughs> I've accidentally unplugged the mouse game. This has been All Over VoiceOver with Kiff BH. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and give us a positive rating. It truly helps. Follow me on Twitter at Kiff BH or on Instagram at Kiff BH or on Vero at Kiff BH. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you soon. Claim victory and depart the field. Werewolf? Yeah.